this a large enough for an owl? Not kingdom, but king. Uh, what's he standing in front of? Giant chains. metal chains. And what do you think those chains are for? Boats. Chains. Not boats, but ships. For wrapping. Large <laughs> ships. He didn't live very long, and there's a clue to why in the photograph. <laughs> he did not get killed by falling. <laughs> did he get the inner rap battle? Huh? Did he get the inner rap uh, battle? What do you think? Uh, smoking. Smoking. Like, uh, yeah, and I'll explain that. He's the reference that they were making. That whole rail line. He's an engineer extraordinaire. The Great Western Railway that was built, leading into London and elsewhere throughout. He helped design it. He will also take Queen Victoria on her first railroad ride. And he is uh, also uh, designed and engineered steamships, bridges, and tunnels. And I have to always put it up here so I can't, you don't need to write it down. But, you know, he's uh, he, in his 53, he died of a stroke because he, I don't know how this is even possible, and I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, he, he smoked 40 cigars a day. I don't even know how one can smoke 40 cigars a day. Oh, you have to get up in the middle of the night and light a cigar. You sleep with the way. cigarette. Maybe you smoke two at a time. <laughs> in the shower, you smoke. <laughs> this whole notion here of, uh, of you know tobacco being addictive and again one of the gifts from uh, the Americas that kept on giving. Well we got chocolate so from there. So we it's have okay. listen, the, the other impact of the Industrial Revolution is it changed the landscape that people were looking at. And while we look at the steam train coming through as being very quaint today, there were a lot of people in England that didn't like it and thought it was ugly. But you can see they need new bridges now because ships are getting larger. So the Royal Albert Bridge, that's named after the consort of Queen Victoria. He also designed a bridge underneath the Thames River so people could walk under the river instead, you know, instead of on the bridges, I guess, for the rain. Problem is that it broke, the river broke twice while they were constructing it because they would obviously to build it underneath they would have to have some kind of a way it's the engineering marvel of building the bridge but it was open to foot traffic in 1843. I don't know if it's still there. I would have to look that up. I would think that it might I don't remember when I was in London seeing it there. Most people cross bridges and such. This is the Brunel's SS Great Britain, which you can actually tour. This one I've toured. This sits in the town of Bristol, near Wales. And down below, you can go through it. It's interesting. You can see a photograph of this um, inauguration. It's the first ocean-going ship with an iron hull and a screw propeller. A suspension bridge, not designed by uh, him, but rather just showing um, um, new style of engineering that changed the landscape, suspension bridges. Road building will also take advantage of new technological innovations. John McAdam was an American and he designed a new kind of road that would be uh, basically our first kind of paved roads. They refer to them as Macadam Roads, named after him. That's why they, I, I, you, you will see they make reference to the, uh, where airplanes land on an airport, they call it the tarmac, and that's partly derived from his name. But here we're basically a engineering of crushed rock, a slightly convex to drain water off of it. But see, these were built not for free use. They were built as, as pri in private, private companies built them. So in order to use them, you had to pay. And so they're often referred to as turnpikes. Now we have, mainly in the eastern United States, when you get on their freeways, they're not free. They call them turnpikes, like the New Jersey Turnpike. 
So anyone been on any of the turnpikes before where? Back east? Uh, yeah, New York. The whole the whole East Coast is you, you can go all the way from from Maine to Florida. To, you have to pay. You don't have to, you can go on the side streets and roads, it'll take you forever. Yeah. It's a toll road basically. And if you get on, they have people who are, you, you, it's, it can be very expensive, and the poor generally don't use it, they're going to stay on the main roads, on the, you know, off of it. But, you know, it's, uh, what it does is it makes people who have cars pay for the use of roads, while people who don't drive cars, out here they pay ultimately for part of that. So they're called turnpikes because they had, you know, a gate down. Then you paid, and then you, they, you went through. And then you went to the other end, and then they let you out. Then to get on somebody else's, you had to pay. Back then, you paid on every road. Okay. This whole concept of a freeway is a California West Coast phenomenon. Okay, of a car culture that developed here. Okay, but if you go back east, uh, and it, and it, it's it's much more efficient to go on the turnpikes. But every time you get on on and off, you get a ticket. When you go off, they, they scan it and they can see how many exits you've traveled. That will determine the cost of it. So it can be pricey. So I uh, hear the map of industrial uh, England. You can see again the focus and shift. You've got your iron mine here. You've got again the Midlands up here. That's the industrial heartland around Manchester to Liverpool because that's where the coal was located. Okay, and so that's where they're going to put the factories once steam power is perfected. So we have new industrial towns. This is a model textile town here, um, and, uh, constructed by Titus Salt uh, as an entrepreneur. So they, to facilitate transportation, they built them on a canal to begin with. This is also 1851. The railway age has begun in the 1840s. Now, this is a signature term, you want to highlight it as a reference to any kind of essay on Great Britain, you can drop this into the introduction as it being known as the workshop of the world. And as the workshop of the world, what I want to remember is that England will mechanize first, it will mass produce cheaply made goods that are more function over fashion. And in 1851, key year here, they will put on the first World's Fair. And the Crystal Exhibition, they built a specially, they built a crystal structure for it. The man in charge of this was Prince Albert, Victoria's husband. And he was not a popular man because he was German and our British xenophobics were very unhappy with him. But the success of this and a few other things, he gained uh, more popularity. The problem is he'll die in 1860. Okay. But this was to be a temporary structure in Hyde Park made of glass. What did it house? It basically housed industrial, Britain's industrial might. It's industrial innovations. It was to show off industrial um, leadership as being the workshop of the world. Six million people came, and I will revisit it one more time when I start discussing Victoria and Albert. Because I am basically now into the um, 19th century, which is actually my favorite period of, of study. Okay. So we can see these images here of the Crystal Cathedral, obviously something very different. They even had a tree brought in, and six million people came, and how did they get there? By train. All right, last thing here, we want to talk about the spread of industrialism, industrialization. A couple of things that are really critical for you. England forbade the export of industrial technology. I think you understand that from the uh, um, chapter test on chapter 24. It forbade the export of industrial technology and the e export forbade the emig emigration, the leaving, 
with an E, emigration of industrial talent. Why would they do that? Keep to themselves. They want to keep the profits for themselves. Now, the first place, though, it will get to would be the United States as a former colony. Well, actually, this, this is right, you know, right after the American colonies become independent. Samuel Slater, 1789, same year as the French Revolution, memorizes the blueprint for a spinning machine. See, at the ports, there would have been customs officials to check your baggage and check your identity. They were so concerned about the emigration. There's no way, well, real way, there's no way off the island other than you know hiring some <coughs> boat to, to take you across to main the continent. But you're going to go to the United States, and the United States will be well suited for an industrial revolution, and will follow on the heels of uh, Britain primarily because it has the same factors of production that Britain had. The only difference is its labor source came from, no, slaves are done. Well, the labor in the factories are not slaves. The slaves are in the fields growing cotton and tobacco. But, and, and the Civil War will start in 1860 anyway, so that's going to disrupt everything. But before that, the main source of labor for the Americas was immigrants. Immigrants, not population growth yet. Immigrants. They're coming in from all over Europe. And they had the coal, they had the iron, they had the uh, entrepreneurs, they had it. All they needed was the, techno the technology. Now, France would be a different story. With, with regard to France, They will be slow to industrialize for a number of reasons. <coughs> What's one reason? Yeah, French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. Lack of coal. The preference of uh, high fashion to mass produced fashion. Slower population growth. What contributed to the slower population growth? No access to species. Yeah, they did. They, they, they did not have that agricultural revolution that the landowning class in Britain has paved the way for. So, therefore, fewer farmers, small-time farmers, left the te left the uh, farms for the cities. So you had a smaller population growth due to the lack of the agriculture revolution. They were really slow. Everything from potatoes, they just were very suspicious the French of potatoes, growing potatoes. Something that had been brought in very early on from the Columbian Exchange found itself very well suited for places like Ireland, being much cooler and wetter, and Eastern Europe, okay, cooler and wetter. But the French, oh, these potatoes. <laughs> they cause sexually transmitted diseases. Yeah, I mean, there were all sorts of things. You know. Potatoes cause syphilis. Uh, what else do I want to say? <laughs> Not prostitutes. To TIL. TIL. And see, because, because of the international wars also, the Napoleonic Wars, which were international, they, they focused more on domestic uh, production and less on international trade. Okay, now let's talk about Germany. The German Confederation, as we are going to call it, of 39 states, 38, 39 states. It, it, in the German Confederation, 
slow industrial development. Why? Yeah, so many fragmented, uh, fragmented Germanys. Uh, fragmented Germanys. So because of this, there were trade barriers. So what we will not get is, and this is kind of, you know, and in a way, this will be a benefit to Germany in the long run. In the short run, it isn't, but in the long run, they will develop after unification, after 1870. They actually unify in 1871 in January, but the last war of unification against France takes place in 1870. And so therefore, since they're later to industrialize, they can take advantage of the new technology, while Britain is still stuck now with what is obsolete technology. So they are going to be there. They are going to skyrocket. They are slow to develop because of their fragmented states with numerous trade barriers, all sorts of different rules, trade, you know, laws and tariffs and this and that. But when they unify in January after 1870. They will take off because they can take advantage of the new technology. Now, Prussia is going to lead the way, though, because it's going to be one of our leading German states along with Austria. But the problem that Prussia had was that it was fragmented also. Okay? And this is going to create a problem that it needs a solution for. So remember, Prussia, when we looked at the map, had a big chunk now given to it after the Congress of Vienna in the Rhine region. Then it had the, and there's some other little tiny pieces in there, and then the bigger chunk here, and then East Prussia over here, okay? So Prussia was fragmented, which made it difficult for it to transport its own goods across its own country, because it had to pass through other Germanys. So what they decide to do, the solution to that problem of their own fragmentation, is to set up a customs union called the Zolvery. Now I want you to highlight this because this is an er early economic union of North German states. Zolvery. It's an early customs, early economic union, a kind of customs trade union that reduced trade barriers. That's the function. It reduced trade barriers among the northern German states. And it will be highly successful. It will start in the 1830s and it will be revamped re uh, uh, through time. It's an early economic union and it will prove to be successful by reducing, what did I say? Trade barriers. The trade barriers between the northern German states. Specifically though, what country, which German state will not be invited? Austria. Austria is definitely out along with Bavaria because they're rival states to the south. So they're not going to benefit from this. So when you look at this particular map right here, what you see is no coal mines, okay? It's, uh, the green are major exposed coal deposits. You don't see them in France except for a couple of little tiny area there and on the border here. Where do we see them? We see them in that Ruhr area of the Rhineland. Now, by the way, when Germany, after World War I, fails to pay its reparation, this will be the opportunity France needs to move in and occupy the Ruhr coal fields for its own use to rebuild after World War I. Okay? So we see some in the eastern parts there and such. So this map, the 100 years between 1800 and 1900, what do we see specifically represented here? What's the term, vocabulary word we want to know? Urbanization. Urbanization. Rapid urbanization between 1800 and 1900, okay? AP Africa, <laughs> African history. <laughs> okay. Now. AP uh, Apple. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, now listen carefully. Uh, Hmm. I will be in here during tutorial the next three days if you want to come in with and uh, talk about your essays. Uh, we need to set up, and this is the longest gap I've done, we need to do a DBQ. But I'm not doing it this week, it'll be next week. You're going to focus on chapter 22, which I'm going to begin to lecture on Wednesday. Okay, so I'm going to be sending you two things. One is the next PowerPoint. What I've noticed and what I told period three is that uh, you know, the, the essay grades, they're, they're, they're normal for what they are. They, there's a tendency to be, in, you know, for some of you to have stuck in that B range. And that's mainly because you're not familiar with your material. You're not reading the prop carefully and then you're not studying enough. And what I'm thinking here is, I don't know how many of you are printing out the student uh, PowerPoints, but that helps you. I'm thinking that some of you must not be taking really good notes. And you're not writing them on your paper in a way that helps you to study for essays. Because that's the critical part, and the essay part's hard. So I'm going to be sending you the one on, the, uh, we're now we're getting into the totally into the 19th century. We're going to get back to the political issues of the unleashing of Enlightenment ideas and our conservative conservatism of um, quintuple alliance trying to crush revolts, but they're going to break out all over Europe in the 1800s. And that's my favorite time period to study anyway, is the 19th century. The 20th war. 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 What's a good war? So, do you remember now Prime. when I told you that I wanted you in from around, you know, 14, after the age of exploration, after 1492 and into the early 1500s, to always keep in the back of your mind mercantilism as a motivating factor that's related to economics. Okay? And that, that, that this is something that is corresponds to the age of exploration when you're reviewing your notes. And it is a driving force for countries, the emerging countries of Western Europe, and even then late into um, uh, Russia under Peter the Great. Again, mercantilism was a highly regulated, highly regulated economic system. Well, it's capitalism, it's commercial capitalism, people could make money. But it was regulated by governments to enhance the treasury of kings, going back to the new monarchs. Okay, you all remember that? Now, when I get to this 19th and 20th century, we're going to have to have new words that you consistently keep in the back of your mind. The three political isms of conservatism, liberalism, and nationalism are going to be key isms for understanding the political events in the 1900s. The economic isms will be very key to understanding the economic and social events of the 19th century and into the 20th century. So these are critical terms. So what are the economic isms? Well, I'm going to start with capitalism, then I'm going to talk about socialism, and then I'm going to talk about communism, as your Karl Marx. And then we'll deal with how it's implemented communism when we have a Russian Revolution. So let's get then to what's referred to as laissez-faire capitalism. This term we will associate with Adam Smith. going to begin then in his book, The Wealth of Nations and Other Writings, to apply natural laws to business. I'll be dealing with him a little bit more later. Well, I'll give you a little bit of a background to him. But the natural laws we talked about, we first started to talk about applying them to understanding the universe. Okay? All the way from Copernicus to Newton. Okay, that explains the heliocentric theory and ultimately why the planets move the way they moved. Okay? Then secondly, we applied natural laws to government right? and then during the Enlightenment period to justify absolutism as well as constitutional governments, Thomas Hobbes to John Locke. Now we're going to apply natural laws to economics. 
right? And there's two fundamental natural laws of business that you need to be aware of, and you probably are at this point. The law of supply and demand. The law of supply and demand, which determines the prices for goods. The other one is the law of competition, and I have them in red, so they're significant. And I want to tell you right now, I want you to kind of circle the word competition. It's a word that we're going to, it's a 19th century term. It's a 19th century term. And we're going to also apply it to Charles Darwin, not Charles Dickens, but Charles Darwin and Karl Marx. We're going to have each a say concerning competition, so it's a key buzzword. What does the law of competition determine in laissez-faire capitalism and capitalism in general? The quality of the product. The quality of the product. Now, there's two other buzzwords I'm going to talk about more specifically on Wednesday, when I see you next. They are associated with the writings of Adam Smith, this whole concept of self-interest. The whole concept of self-interest. That's going to drive uh, capitalism. And, and laissez-faire capitalism, we can also refer to it as industrial capitalism. <coughs> versus the commercial capitalism that got going with the age of exploration. This self-interest will be a driving force, and I'm going to also talk about um, Adam Smith's use of the word invisible hand, the means by which all of this worked. It's not any one person or any one government with regulations. It's going to represent, and I'm going to talk about it more, the collective entrepreneurs. Now, I want to send to you, and, and, and by the way, I just want to say here, I've just decided on this one here. You make sure on this packet, because I'm going to start to send you, uh, we're going to get more uh, detailed primary sources for the 19th and 20th century. Okay, This one started off with discipline in the factories, a protest against the machinery, and the a primary source, and I would make sure I read this on the Liverpool to Manchester Railway, what it was like. And then the rest of these are the, called Manchester accounts. Okay, they're Manchester accounts. And of all of those Manchester accounts, and read them carefully, I would focus on Edwin Chadwick, who I'll come back to later, who wrote about sanitary condition, and ate Elizabeth Gaskell, a little clip from, or vignette from the uh, story Mary Barton. Ignore me at your peril. Read it with a highlighter pen. It doesn't have to be a great detail. But you don't have time to read this stuff at the end before the test. Um, Let's see, so uh, Angus Reach has three little readings from 1849 and um, 1890. What do I want you to be, and 1894, what do I want you to be thinking about when you're reading the Manchester accounts? Huh? P no? Well, POV for sure. <laughs> the first one is 1802 and the last one is 1894. Change, change over time. Okay? So I will be sending you also a reading by a, 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 a clip from Adam Smith's book with some questions. That's going to be due on Friday after the test. You can do it Thursday night. Don't wait till the last minute to study because we're not we're going to run out of test grades pretty soon. I'm going to be updating the grades with this essay, which I didn't put in the last grading period. 
also the last test, which will hopefully, that one wasn't as high as the one before. Okay, so I want to talk about the four main principles of, log, of Adam Smith that I'm going to basically uh, simplify for you and then I'm going to get into a little bit more detail on it because this is one huge old book. <coughs> so number one, he said, entrepreneurs should be free to do whatever it takes to make a profit. That entrepreneurs should be free to do whatever it takes to make a profit, meaning run their business whatever it way it takes to make a business. And if that means child labor, Adam Smith would say, okay. It's not going to be the preferred method in our 19th century of Victorian Britain British ideals. Number two, what is good for the entrepreneur is good for everyone, Adam Smith said. What is good for the entrepreneur is good for everyone. I mean by good for everyone because if the, entre the entrepreneur gets a profit, what's he do with that profit? He what? Can't hear. What does he do? What does the quintessential uh, uh, British entrepreneur do with his profit? Does he spend it on clothing? Yes, he reinvests it. And when he reinvests it, it expands the business. And when businesses are expanded, then how, why, how is this good for everyone? Jobs. jobs. And the more jobs there are, with, wa with the wages paid, however low they are to start with, then what happens? They buy more goods, and this is more profit, back to the circle. So what is good for the entrepreneur is good for everyone in that a profit leads to expansion, leads to jobs, leads to more profit. Three, free competition gives people the chance to do the best job they can. And why do you want your workers to do the best job they can? Huh? And why would they buy your products? Quality. It leads to uh, quality improvement. So, free competition. There's that word competition again. You could go ahead and circle it again as a key buzzword. Free competition gives people a chance to do the best job they can, which leads to improved quality of goods and services. Government's role, Adam Smith says, is basically to keep order, and that's it, to keep order. So if there are lawsuits, then the government will have courts to adjudicate lawsuits that from one entrepreneur to another. Now, there are three features associated with capitalism. And one is, again, private ownership. Now we've had private ownership in mercantilism, but it's highly regulated. This one is going to be, is basically free enterprise, okay? Free enterprise. Individuals own capital. The capital can, is, is what is used to invest in. We generally, that's where the word capital in capitalism comes from. Generally we think of it in terms of money, capital meaning money, but it can be other things that can be represent money. You have something of value. This you invest, this creates new business. This is called free enterprise system, the other name for capitalism. The second thing that drives it that's critical is the profit motive. The profit motive, the profit motive, the profit motive. The third is that you have, a, it, within capitalism, to make this work, what's called a market economy. That you have some kind of property. Now, property is a, a bigger term than what you think of as land. It can be land. It could be goods such as machines, textile machines. 
It can be time and then the labor that is used to make it is all part of property. All of it has value. And with it, you use, you're used to make a profit. There's that buzzword again, profit. Now, you might, again, note underneath uh, market economy, this will work, Adam Smith says, like an invisible hand. And next to profit motive, you can put down self-interest. issues from the post-collapse of the Soviet Union. So if you haven't been watching it and you don't know anything about what I'm talking about, you better get online. And I'm going to tell you right now, you want to go to the top-notch universities out there, you're going to be mixing with the elite from other universities. And I'm going to tell you right now, they're going to be savvy to what's going on in the world. Okay, so, which one you get? 20, okay, so Adam Smith. So now I'm a little bit ahead of period three. Because I spent some time with them on essays that I had done before with you. So he is Scottish. He is a man of the 18th century whose ideas will have an impact on the 19th century. Okay? Scottish. Physiocrat. Though he did not emphasize land as French physiocrats did. He's a physiocrat, meaning application of, again, um, natural laws to um, business again. This is the this is the, the economics counterpart to at But he is, a, he is referred to as a physiocrat, but he does not emphasize land, but emphasizes labor and division of labor as key. So the story goes, he was kidnapped at the age of four by gypsies. You've got to look this up. Where would the gypsies be? He was rescued by his uncle. He had no siblings, and he never married. He was devoted to his mother and to his life's work here. And he, at the, you could tell how smart he was because, again, I told you already, you're going to emerge. At 14, he entered the University of Glasgow in Scotland. He has had a passion for liberty, passion for liberty. So this is of the Enlightenment period. He was probably a deist. Unfortunately, he destroyed most of his manuscripts before he died. Don't know why. He is referred to as an economist in those days. That was an insult. I'm not sure it's even better today. You know, economists are supposed to try to figure out how to prevent economic decline, but it doesn't happen. He's the man that is associated with the term laissez-faire. His book is called The Wealth of Nations. Now listen, the, what's the date of this book? And what's significant about 1776? That's the American Revolution. So by the time that's finished, both Enlightenment ideas and economic ideas are going to be implemented. Okay? So the laissez term fair, that, that comes from the French to basically let them do as they see fit, to let them do as they see fit, or leave us alone. He did also favor strong government, but he wanted government to help establish new industries. 
his purpose, the purpose of the wealth of nations. And by the way, by 1800, it was translated into every Western European language except Portuguese. Don't know why Portuguese. The purpose was to, this is significant, increase national wealth by reducing barriers. Increase national wealth by reducing barriers. And what would be another term for the barriers? Tariffs. Tariffs. The tax on imported goods. Okay? So that's where I will pick up on Wednesday. This, this, uh, this, um, PowerPoint is not that long. Sorry. And he's important. Is he a part? Yeah, I know. The whole PowerPoint's not that long, but he's important. I can't handle school anymore. I fucking fell asleep so much. I only have two or no cards. Yeah, me too. Actually, we have, yeah, I just have freaking Adam Smith. I was looking at it, I was like, I don't think we took notes on him yet. <laughs> oh, I forgot to stop recording. Not week after, during tutorial, I was going to lecture. Review. Because I'm behind, and here's what happened. Because I'm aware I was last year, which wouldn't be a problem. And now we're going into the testing period, and it's I've noticed it's taken up uh, so far the new schedule that we're on this year versus last year is taking more time. So I'm a little bit worried about it. So we're going to have to see where we can make it up. I may have to do, though I don't really want to do it, I may have to do a couple after-school sessions. Um, so I'll let you know. That was the condition in the old days when I first started teaching AP. We didn't get out of school until like June 20th. Uh, and then we took the test like the first week in May. That was a lot of time after that test for students. Now there's like less than two weeks once we finish the test. And so I've been able to get everything done, but now I'm a little bit worried. So I'm going to have to see about it. So some people in period three were kind of interested in maybe um, you know, maybe a Saturday. I might do it if I, you know, but that's on my time, so we'll have to see. They were favoring that a little bit later in the morning. I used to do Saturday sessions all the time. I did after school sessions all the time. I did about eight after school sessions when I first started teaching because the schedule start we started so late and it was hard to get the material through. It's only been within the last few years as they moved you up in August. We used to start after September. And you know, that's really made a big difference. So we'll just have to see if you can make the if you can make it, fine. If you can't, just have to get the notes from someone else. Okay, so we'll all see where I am, and we'll see probably if we can get back to having tutorial periods then. we got testing going on next week at Casey. The week after that is going to be the start of the other testing for sophomores, and that continues after we get back. So I may, I'm going to see if I can get a couple of the last few tutorials to do that. Okay, so we, we're talking about Adam Smith now, all right? And these economic isms are critical. Adam Smith, I said, he is a man of the 18th century, but his ideas are going to be important in the 19th and 20th centuries. Very, very important. We call them a physiocrat, though there is less of the interest in agriculture reform. He's not interested in the agriculture reforms uh, that most physiocrats, especially in France, were interested, like Jacques Turgot from the Louis XVI's time. Um, and, and by the way, I today uploaded, I uploaded the assignment, this one here, oh, okay, let me make sure you understand, so due dates. I want all the cards by tomorrow. That's your homework. You should be caught up with them. I've tried to keep you up with the uh, cards. I will finish the last card on the Utopian Socialist today. 
Card to do tomorrow. Okay, Friday's the test. This Adam Smith primary source with 10 questions is due Monday. Okay, cards tomorrow, test on Friday, Adam Smith on Monday. Okay, so we've got those. We're all okay with that? Okay, now, uh, as far as Adam Smith was concerned, his interest was more in the um, lesson less in agriculture, okay, and more in uh, with uh, reforms regarding labor and the division of labor in production, okay? Again, being economist was an insult in those terms in those days. Uh, Laissez-faire was a term that he used, and again, the wealth of nations, I think. The purpose was, again, to Increase natural wealth by reducing barriers, which in case of tariffs and trade. If this was a profound attack on <coughs> mercantilism. He is, and I would highlight this, the philosopher of free market, and that is a, that is anti-mercantilism. Okay, free market, which I'm going to be talking about. The British are going to start it. There will be resistance in Britain by many of the landowners to dropping these barriers because they were very protectionist. But ultimately, we're going to see it happen. He is going to use reason and the application of natural laws to explain how an economy actually worked. So what we have seen, starting in the Renaissance, even with Machiavelli, who looked at how successful princes actually ruled, here, what we're going to see is the use of reason to see how an economy uh, should be should run. Okay, he is going to come up with the four maxims or four rules for taxation. I went ahead and wrote them out here, and there, if you printed out the um, printed it out on the um, PowerPoint website, make sure you just know what is proportionality mean for taxation. What way is it equal? Is it also related to advocating a progressive tax? These are all things we're still talking about today. Maybe that's why the word economics is still an insult. What does proportionality mean? Those who who make more pay more. Okay. And this comes right out of the French Revolution, in which who paid the highest taxes but made the least amount of money, proportionally. <coughs> Peasants did, okay? And then what's transparency? Huh? What, is, what do we mean by transparency and taxation? Yeah, everybody pays, and you know that everybody pays. See, that's an issue today. Okay, because some, uh, you know, wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people don't pay taxes. How do they get around it? Because it's not so transparent. They're breaking the law, but they're doing it anyway. How are they hiding their wealth? There's even accusations of Apple doing this. Foreign accounts, offshore accounts, okay, uh, those kind of things. So, again, uh, unlocking it where, you know, people are hiding taxes. And then efficiency. You know, or convenience, just making it easy to pay, which some would say it's not very easy to pay today when you start looking at the tax forms, which you guys don't do, but your parents are probably involved in it right now. Okay, to pay it if they got businesses and investments, and it's just not, it's got form upon form upon form, and it's, it's not very convenient, and it's neither is it very efficient. So he's starting to talk about it. Okay, so now, and listen, with Adam Smith, you may want to have two cards. I, you know what, I would make a card on just some of the background to Adam Smith. What I would do with him there, you know, is come up with the terms associated with him. Maybe those four basic rules we uh, uh, out of his uh, Wealth of Nation that, start, that you have in your notes there. What's good for the entrepreneurs, good for everyone. Okay, um, what were the other ones on that one? Good for the entrepreneurs, good for everyone. Well, you put down the invisible hand as a term. Yeah. And 
invisible hand. You'll bring out the um, uh, entrepreneur should be free to do whatever it takes to make a profit, run their business whatever way. Free competition gives people a chance to do the best job they do, leading to quality. Government's role is to keep order. And then things like private ownership, profit motive, and market economy. Those are all things that should be on the card, along with the wealth of nations, invisible hand, self-interest. I would do a card for him, a second card, with the two laws. Okay? Because what, the, what does the law of supply and demand determine in a capitalist system? Prices of goods. Okay? And very simply, if you have a limited supply of something, what happens to the prices? Huh? Prices go up. Prices go up. Okay? Now, because prices go up, it has an effect. Cause, effect. When prices go up, people turn to other solutions. Say it again? People turn to other solutions. No, what do you mean other solutions? Like if the product becomes more expensive, they turn to another type of or way of inventing that product to make it cheaper. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you're you're on you're right there. What what it's really doing is it it stimulates the produce uh, competition appears. Very simply. When you have a limited supply of something and the price goes up, it stimulates competition to jump in. Why do they want to jump in? Well, not, not that they can over the lower price, because they want to make money. Okay? And if they can't, if you have more competition in there, yeah, the price will go down. Here's the, you know, the example is uh, Apple when they introduced the iPad. Okay? Now, the problem is apples are exception to the rule in a lot of cases because they're able to keep their prices up pretty high, yeah. partially because of the quality of it and, and such. But more than anything, what it did is it created a ripple effect. Now we've got tablets galore out there on the market. Okay? And then even the cell phones. What did Apple have to finally do? Now, in terms of price. They had to. They had to issue the uh, Apple Five C, C. C, which was a little bit cheaper. Okay, Apple I was like cheap. maybe that's the C for cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Some said it was the C for China, but okay. But nonetheless, then that okay, should not be everything. <laughs> it, because self, because the Android systems and the Galaxy phones are out there and they are cheaper than the Apple phone, then all of a sudden they have to make it. So when you have a limited supply, you know, the price goes up, but what it does is it attracts competition and then that does have a ripple effect in terms of lowering the prices, okay? When you have an excess of something, then the price goes down. Then what happens, the effect of that is capital looks elsewhere for different opportunities to invest in other things. Also, the supply, law of supply and demand that de determines prices. You guys like quit moving that thing around over there? Nose blowing tissue boxes. What? Just put wheels on it. Look out, go that way. Okay. We have the Caltech uh, robot uh, competition that they're putting on on the news. Okay, specialization of function and how it relates to division of labor. That if you can specialize, so again, his his main contribution to explain in which if you can specialize a division of labor, what it does is it increases productivity. If you can specialize in producing a product in a certain way through a division of labor, it increases productivity because it reduces wasted time. And it sharpens the worker's skill if you do the same thing over and over. The downside, it gets boring. And especially if you're doing it 14 hours a day. So the example of this Okay, and what it does is specialization will lower the price. So his example that you want to put in for supply and demand is this pin factory example. So we don't think about this, but this is in, you know, he published this in 1776. So generally speaking, before specialization, one worker could make about 20 pins a day. But there was a lot of wasted time. 
and this was through, don't ask me how, you'd have to read the book, 18 steps. It took 18 steps to make a pin. It took 18 steps to make a pin. So, if you put it on an assembly line where workers specialize in one task, one function, and then you could have 10 workers working on the 18 steps, they could make 48,000 pins in a day. So you can see here that this is definitely a good example. Now, the details of the pin uh, factory wouldn't necessarily be important to know. Uh, writing it down helps you to understand how productivity improved. But, you know, if it's in an essay, you could name drop it. You know, the pin factory through specialization improved productivity and lowered prices. So that's basically the result. Okay, productivity went up, prices went down. Now, this is critical, and you're going to put a star by it because we're we're really in and this whole 19th century is such a fascinating period. I wish I could spend more time on. It. And if you have, if you do take in college some history, European history, the 19th century is just really interesting. But we this is a period now where our international trade begins to specialize as well. What started off with colonial trade in the age of exploration, in which colonies, their role was to provide resources to the mother country as part of mercantilism. Okay, so like the United States, the colonies of the U.S. got, got, got so upset, okay, is that everything had to be channeled through the Britain, okay, to the other countries. But international trade will support specialization. That some countries who have certain raw materials or even certain climates, the nose blowing brigade, <laughs> we should all synchronize, have synchronized nose blowing. Beautiful. All right, so international trade, that some countries could produce cheaper because they have access to raw materials or even climate. And then they could then they could produce more cheaply and everyone would have more, okay, as long as you lower the tariffs on incoming countries. Let's use an example of France. What did France have produced that the other countries of Europe didn't produce was wine, high quality wine. Okay, in mercantilism, the, uh, there might be a few wineries in the southern, southern part of Britain producing wine. But they, of course, would want tariffs slapped on French wine, so people make their wine cheaper and people would buy it. Even though French wine tasted better, unless you were really rich, you, you, you buy the tariffed wine. But if you could reduce the tariffs, then what, what would happen to uh, wine production in Britain? Not go down, it would disappear, okay? It would go, it might, it might be one wine early left or whatever, okay? But nonetheless, it's gonna go down. Or, or they have to improve their quality. Okay? So international trade, this is going to lead to ultimately free trade. Okay? We're going to see the benefits of free trade. Which country will start the ball rolling on free trade? England. Britain will. Great Britain will. The other countries are going to be slow, especially the French. Because they don't, and what was it that Britain had that was able to produce and specialize in that the rest of Europe Cotton textile fabrics, mass produced cheaper. Second law of competition. When prices are above or below what's called the natural rate, supply and demand adjusts. Okay, so when prices fluctuate, which they do in a capitalist system, why people are always looking at the paper for the sales, okay, or they're shopping now with their iPhones or their smartphones, trying to find price matches, okay? We're taking it to a really high level now that they, Adam Smith could just probably push an agreement possible, okay? So when prices are above or below the natural rate, and that natural is in quotation marks, it just depends, it, uh, supply and demand uh, adjusts. The profit motive, the profit motive, the profit motive, the profit motive is driven by self-interest. 
self-interest. So he says, we rely on our meat, not on the goodwill of the butcher. Oh, you have to have this day because it's just for your family. But the, rather, the concern for his own income. Okay? It's like, it, it is a lie when you talk about the age of exploration. You know, uh, it's not the desire for spices. Oh, they have to have spices for their food. We can't have them eating unspicy food. But rather the profits from spices. But here, okay, it's, it takes on a bigger meaning because, again, he's going to see it for everything. We don't rely on the butcher of his concern for you to have a nice steak. The butcher's concerned about his own income. Profit. That's why he's selling the meat. Okay? Profit motive. Is it selfish? Some said yes. But Adam Smith, who was a professor of moral philosophy at Glasgow University in uh, Scotland, said it was more it was morally justified. That it was he said it's not selfish because it benefits everyone. How does the selfish motive of the butcher benefit everyone? You get the food. You got available meat for everybody. Okay. So what's good for the entrepreneur is good for everyone. And this mutual self-interest of everybody, whether it's the butcher, the baker, or the candlestick maker, producing for their own self-interest and profit is good for everyone because it provides for meat, bread, and candlesticks that everyone needs. This is the invisible hand. It works without any any interference or any any direct thinking about it. It's just it just happens. Okay? So when you promote your own good, if you're promoting good good for everyone. So your own self interest and human greed, you unknowingly promote the interest of society and the whole, the benefit of everyone, the interest of society. This is what we call a free market. A free market. Government regulation interferes with the invisible hand, Adam Smith says. Government regulation interferes with the invisible hand. Yes, it will lead to some insecurity for people, and it will lead to dependence on other nations for goods. But in the long run, it's supposed to work out. And this represents these, these ideas of application of natural laws, which we started with, with the universe. And then political science, the best form of government, whether it was absolute or constitutional. And now uh, we're applying it to uh, economics as well. So here is what he said in The Wealth of the Nation. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own interests. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love, and never talk to them about our own necessities, but of their advantages. So one last thing, this Wealth of Nations. It was really a set of five books. And basically, it limited the government's role to really just keeping order, handling disputes between businesses, contracts. It represents the private person over the state. Now listen clearly to that part. You want to highlight it. I'm, going to look, I'm looking for some themes in the 19th century. Capitalism represents the private person over the state. This will be a ch this will be challenged, okay, by our socialists and our communists, and in the 20th century by the fascists. We put the state over the individual. See, here's the problem. I'll just mention China. China, which was a communist economy under 
business, business, uh, mouth, business, and business, and then uh, after the death of Mao, signing contracts. Deng Xiaoping began to kind of modernize uh, and such. Still moving from a communist system to more of a socialist system that allows for some private ownership and private profits. The problem that China has is it can't go all the way without, go all the way to capitalism without doing what? Going all the way to democracy. Because in a democratic system, you've got to have free access to information full information, okay, in capitalism you have to, in democracy you have to. So that's going to be a restraint and, and you know, eventually something's going to happen in China, okay, as the old guard tries to keep clinging to power, okay. So, key elements of the book then, the division of labor as expressed in the PIN system as a review, the concept of specialization which improves productivity and lowers prices. And again, the value of goods and services relates to the scarcity of an item and the amount of labor used. And the role of money will be pivotal in investment, in capitalism, because you know what it says, it takes money to make money. That's why even the workers, what we're going to see when communism or socialism, communist ideas begin to be developed, that if a worker can just make enough money and save enough money, they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and maybe start their own business, and that's what they were hoping for. The role of money is basically for investment. That it takes money to make money in capitalism. Okay, so let me let me shift gears here. Adam Smith's ideas are going to be very influential in our development of economics, and it's appropriate that a it was referred to as the Manchester School of Economics. The two people are Thomas Malthus and David Ricardo. They're each going to contribute to Adam Smith's ideas. They refine his ideas into what we call classical economics. Sometimes in economics it's referred to as liberal economics. So classical economics, liberal economics, or classical liberalism sometimes is the other way. So our laissez-faire is going to eventually morph into a, diff a, a classical economics. We will have, though, some government intervention, okay, as it becomes necessary. So at Manchester, they called these the, the economics, the classical economics. It's laissez-faire, basically term is going to be referred to as classical economics, the dismal sciences, which should tell you something about it. So. What did you major in? I majored in the dismal sciences. Okay, and the dismal sciences is going to help explain why wages were kept low and workers were lived in such poverty. Because it was the natural laws that kept workers in lower wages and kept poor. Unless the Victorians thought if you worked hard enough and were moral enough, you could break out and become rich. All right, and again, what drives it again is that self-interest. And I'll talk about the ideas of the dismal sciences at the Manchester School that Malthus and Ricardo added to, added to Adam Smith's ideas. And this basically will lead to, again, reducing all foreign bar barriers to trade and what we call free trade. Okay, so let's talk about Pop Malthus, as he was called. So it's interesting, he's born in the same year that 
the Wealth of Nations is published. So it's something that he will have read growing up or going to school. Okay, and he's the first professor of political economy, which is another way of calling him an economist, a dirty word economist. Now, the thing with Malthus, have any of you heard of Malthus before this class? In what reference? Say again? And what uh, did, in human geography was talked about in terms of population growth? Okay. I'm going to tell you right now, uh, he wrote an essay on the principle of population. You can note on this that this will influence Darwin. Darwin's going to have a hard time putting together all the data he's collected on his journey around the world that he took from 1831 to 35, or 36. Okay, five years. He's going to have trouble putting it together, and then it's like a light bulb moment for him when he reads this essay by Thomas Malthus. Because what basically Malthus said, and what becomes known as the Malthusian theory, though it's been mostly discredited today, because there's no way Thomas Malthus would believe that there could be seven billion people living on planet Earth today. All right, he just said it, it couldn't happen. Because in his essay he said population, grow, uh, uh, population grows geometrically, while food grows arithmetically. Which is a word I can't say. Arithmetically. 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 Okay, now listen, what's this basically mean? Let's simplify it without that word in there. Population grows faster than the supply of food. And he believed that this would therefore be a kind of a check to population, that the, because population uh, grows faster than the food supply, that population, this would check population. That's why we would look at 7 billion today as being an impossible, impossible. So why is it that it, his prediction didn't come true? Meaning that you couldn't possibly have 7 billion people. Technology has improved the production of food. We are genetically modifying food. We can grow far more food. We've improved crop yields. What are we looking at? The box? Okay. All right. So, really, basically what he's going to say here, okay, with, with Thomas Malthus, <coughs> is that we can expect there to be poor. Poor people are going to be, poverty will be part of the social landscape. Because it's part of the natural laws. Okay, so what we need then is David Ricardo. They are, they are about the same age, also a member of the Manchester School. He's going to write on the principles of political economy. Basically, he's going to write about e economics and then taxation. He will, he, in refining Adam Smith's ideas, he's basically going to emphasize more of the specialization part and importing goods that you don't produce because it's not something you're good at producing. If England's not good at producing wine, produce something else. Produce beer. But don't produce wine. And then import the wine at free trade. And see, here's the deal, though. And these corn laws, these grain tariffs, that put it, slapped a tariff. And we use, they call them the corn laws, but corn is just the term for grain, wheat, barley. It could be corn, too. So corn in Europe wasn't eaten as we eat corn. In fact, today, Europeans don't eat corn. On the cotton, no, they don't. They feed it to their pigs and animals. So, well, I would bet more than anything, the corn they grow over there today is not the corn that is we have here. That's nice and sweet. I, yeah, I think it's mainly a fodder. 
but it says, hey, it really hurt the British economy. And then what will also be the little push to it is the potato bag. Okay? And this is also the era of Queen Victoria, who's very unhappy to see her Irish subjects dying in the great numbers and leaving in the great numbers. But here's the thing. The, uh, it's all highlight the iron law of wages. And this he relates to supply and demand. So he's saying, hey, here's what happens. When workers get higher wages beyond the natural limit, when workers get higher wages, then they have more children. When they have more children, what does that do to the labor force? It gets, it, the labor force gets bigger. And when you have a bigger labor force, what happens to their wages? It goes down. So when the wages go down, people have fewer children. When they have fewer children, the labor force gets smaller. And when the labor force gets smaller, wages go up. It's a never-ending cycle. Okay, It's part of a business cycle. But it's best not to interfere with it. This is why they called it the dismal sciences that workers cannot change the system because it is natural, okay? But it's going to change, all right? And part of it has to do with our poets being the unofficial legislators of the world, the people like Elizabeth Gaskell and Charles Dickens, who are writing about the horrid, wretched circumstances that, peasants, uh, that the uh, workers are living in children working in the mines. It is not acceptable now to our Europeans of our middle classes who are really influenced by evangelical Christianity to, to care about the poor. Plus, there's another element in there, and that has to do with the workers. Now, this is critical. And what I really want you to understand now, as we're getting in toward the, you know, honing in on the middle of the 18th century, 19th century, and 20th century, is that the workers are now becoming, becoming a potent force, okay? They're working 14 hours, 14 hour days. They're working 14-hour days with who has the main labor? Women and children, okay? Unemployment was a constant worry. Being fired was a constant worry. There was no protections for workers. Literally, women would have birth a baby and be back at work the next day almost. I know, and Seems that's like because they if they didn't, they would lose either. their job. All right? Oh, maybe the best thing was to have your baby on a Saturday night because you had Sunday off. Huh? I know, I'm just saying. You're at work and you have your baby. I'll be back tomorrow. So, <laughs> workers, see, here's the thing now that's really critical. Workers are going to be concentrated in cities and in factories. Was their misery necessarily worse than it was to be a peasant in the, in the Dark Ages? No. no. And in fact, people moved to the city because it was, despite it hard to believe, a little higher standard of living than often working in the fields, okay, uh, where things weren't as secure, and plus they weren't as secure anyway. So, but workers are concentrated in the city and, the, and in the factories where their misery was more apparent. Their collective misery was more uh, more apparent. That's why it could be written about by Dickens and Glasgow. And the middle class who wasn't aware of it would be made aware of it. And if you're all really miserably poor, living in pitiful conditions together, what are you going to do in the factory if you get the chance? Complain, complain, complain. And there's nothing more than... Complaints are going to lead someone of you to rise up and to begin to organize. Okay, it's a this is really critical here to put a star by this development of what's called solidarity and class interests. What's the solidarity mean? 
Union. It's not a worker union. This is a term we'll see again with the solidarity movement in, in the 1970s and 80s in Poland as they begin to break from the Soviet Union. But what is solidarity it's a, mean? it's a workers' union. Huh? It's a workers' union or a rise to rise up. Well, if you're if you're in solidarity, you're in, you are united uh, in common interests. You are united in some kind of common interest. And the common interest here is your class interest of being in in which class? No, working class. Now you can start using words like working class, which I kept trying to ding you on, on essays, back in the Renaissance. There's no working class in the Renaissance, okay? The other place I dinged you, keep dinging you, is using the word citizen. Okay, citizen, we won't have that term until really we get the right to vote. That's implied in it, so be careful about how you use words, and now by the end of the year you should. So, what are the two classes of the 19th century now? Working class and middle class. It could be upper middle class, they would be your owners. But we no longer have which class to deal with. <coughs> Aristocratic class, they're done. Okay? And our peasant class is going to really ramp down in size. Okay? Uh, and, and not really be that significant, except in places like Russia at the end of the 1800s. Okay? And the, our development of solidarity is going to lead them to, to create these associations. We're going to call them labor unions. And the goals of labor unions are twofold. They are increased wages and improve working conditions. Of course, who's going to be against this? POV? The owner class. And that's why the owner class is associated with Parliament. And they passed the Combination Acts of 1800 that prohibited the formation of unions. Now, here's the other critical thing here, okay? This whole dismal sciences of workers expecting to live in poverty, long hours, tedious work on the assembly line, working to the, what did he say on the video? The hooter. What's the hooter in English? Oh. No, that's it in there. That's Hooters. The hooter in English? English? <laughs> Is the yeah the bell the word you know the the, oh. the, the sound the restaurant. Hey, we all deal with a hooter here every day. It's called a class bell. You can't you can't go from one place to the other unless the hooter rings. But listen, 1824, we've got labor agitation. Draw an arrow up to misery in the factory and development of solidarity. You've got maybe the one or two of you in here that are going to be brave enough to say, I think we should organize a labor. And what tactics did labor unions use that would be illegal? Strikes. Strikes, okay, and that kind of thing. Work stoppages and strikes. But you see, labor agitation is going to ultimately, the fear of the owner class is that these workers, will demand to have what kind of an economic system that would benefit them? Socialism. And so, by the, and I changed this on the PowerPoint, you'll notice it. Just, uh, and there are more than one. I just changed it, I think, on the PowerPoint that I gave you, it said 1874, 71. I went ahead to change it to this one right here, because it's on this one here. 1875, trade ended limitations placed on unions. See, I and mean, here's the other thing. What we're going to begin to see is workers are going to agitate for one thing they didn't have. What right did they not have? To vote. And that's going to be a tipping point. And why the, eight, why the 19th century is so interesting. Because I'm reading a book right now on the anatomy of fascism. 
And while it was I've just always been very interested in where all why this all of a sudden, you know, the seeds of what we call Nazism develops. And actually the seeds of it are planted really start to be planted in the later 1800s when working class people have the right to vote and they organize themselves into mass political parties. Yet they're not very sophisticated because they're not very educated and they're easily led by leaders who have their own agenda going. Okay? And the fear of the upper classes is when the working class begins to vote. Okay? They will get the right to vote eventually. Now, this is the period, and I want you to understand and why the 19th century is so interesting. It is really a proliferation after 1850. What does proliferation mean? Rapid spread of movements and doctrines that we didn't have before. What we can call ideologies, a set of beliefs, and that will have behind them mass movements. Of course, fascism couldn't have taken place as a mass movement until the mass media came into place. Okay, and that's going to really begin to ramp up in the late 19th century. What we mean by an ism or an ideology or set of beliefs is it is in direct competition with other doctrines. It will have supporters and rivals. And it, but it represents an analysis of society. All right, and it really, what happened, what was the 1815 date? Why I have that up there? Where we see these isms begin to develop after what event? Somebody said it. Congress of Vienna, okay? And we'll come back to that in the next PowerPoint. This whole Congress of Vienna. And they're gonna, the conservatism aspect of traditional absolute rule or at least monarchical rule, and denying people individual rights and natural rights, uh, and the focus on the aristocracy, uh, all of that is going to try, they're going to try to prevent the Enlightenment ideas from emerging in, but they're going to go and they're going to hitch their wagon, these Enlightenment ideas of liberalism and nationalism, they're going to hitch their wagon to the politicalisms of, of socialism and communism. So let's talk about socialism, and I'm revisiting it more later. So the term in the English language first appears in 1832 in the literature. But really, what we're going to see is the, you can put down next to that, the, revol the revolts of 1848. This what makes this 19th century so interesting is we're going to have a whole series of revolts. And they're really going to rise out of what one city? Revolution Central, Paris. Okay? The common ideas of all our socialists Okay. The common ideas of the socialists is that they believe that laissez-faire was outrageously unjust. Outrageously unjust. That it was wrong for the owners to have so much economic power. That it was totally wrong for the owners to have so much economic power. That they could deny work set wages for their own self-interest or profit. They favored communal ownership. They favored communal ownership of especially the most important parts of the economy. Communal meaning society. And the most important parts of the economy would be the banks and the factories with its machines, land itself, property, land, and transportation. They favored it being communally owned. They're not, they're not against private profits, okay, except in the, in the most important segments of the economy. They believe it should be communally owned, okay, banks and factories and transportation and land. And they also wanted a more equal distribution of the national income. 
going mainly to the owners. They want a more equal distribution of the national income. They disliked competition. Here's that word again. Every time you see competition, I want you to circle it. I want you to see it as a common term that we can connect to other things in case there are compare contrast essays. So what they, you know, they, said they, they wanted harmony. Co I put down under favor cooperation. If they're going to believe that you could be cooperative. And they rejected laissez-faire. Now, our utopian socialists. So we've got uh, Thomas Malthus's card number 62. He was called Pop Malthus, the short pop for population, not because he was like your grandpa. <laughs> yeah. It's population Malthus. Okay, this is the last card. This is our utopian socialists. And I don't know why I'm so far ahead here. Because I got started and we might, we might have enough time to work on a couple cards. We'll see. Okay, what the utopian socialists is they favored, and I have it in red so you know it's important, they favored model communities <coughs> to showcase the benefits of socialism. So they favored model communities to showcase the benefits of socialism. So have you ever been to a model home? Tour to model home. I love the tour. They're always nice. They're they're they're, they're, they're this is a showcase. You know, a kind of utopian house that you want to live in. Okay, it doesn't have any no junk and clutter, and it's clean, and I got the nice furniture and all the top notch appliances. Okay, so so let's start with Robert Owen as as one of our two. Utopian socialists. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do a spoiler alert. These model communities didn't work. They didn't work. Okay? Now, Robert Owen, we can see him here. Now, he is significant in other ways as well. Um, the, back, the background from him, you know, he, he, started, he was a cotton lord. But see, he goes to the other side. Just like I told you that the German industrialists and the spread of uh, industrialization sent their sons to, did I tell you that? And the spread of industrialization? Uh, many German industrialists sent their sons to learn the cotton trade in Manchester. Did I talk about that? Yeah. One of them included Frederick Engels, except that Frederick Engels was rare in that he sided with the workers. Okay. Instead of becoming like his father, Cotton, you know, basically a you know a, a, a rich owner. Same thing with Robert Owen. Okay, he was apprenticed at the age of ten, and then became a supervisor uh, in a textile factory at nineteen. But see, he's he was appalled at the working condition and living conditions of the workers. He sympathized. So he decided that he would, with the money he made, buy a mill and transform it into a model mill. And he did this in Scotland. It was really one of the, the you know, in the southern part of Scotland, uh, a, and, and Leonard. he created a model, a model community and uh, through a model uh, uh, factory. So what did he do here? <clears throat> he paid higher wages than most. He paid higher wages. Not high wages, but higher wages. He reduced the uh, uh, work week, or, or the work day. I don't know what he reduced it to, but he did. He provide, he provide, he built schools. He, 
provided housing and a company store as well. So this sounds really very good, except it didn't work. What do you think? Why do you think it didn't work? <laughs> well, no, it's not bad. It just meant he got less profits, but he was willing to get less profits. Well, it turned out that when the workers got a little higher wages, it's not that they wanted more. They would often leave because they had they saved enough that they could go out and establish themselves. Plus, you know, you are, I don't know the whole details of it, but again, the whole cooperation aspect of it just didn't work very well. Okay? And then, of course, the other thing was he was anti-vice. And for workers, that meant anti-drinking. And our, our workers had gotten a pretty good taste for gin, which had become really the working man's drink. It was pretty cheap. Know, as well as the other high um, uh, octane uh, um, distilled spirits, way more alcohol in them than wine or beer. So he would fine workers if they were drunk, okay, and they just didn't like it, all right. So what happened ultimately? Um, and, and he said no children under 10 could work. He lowered the work day to, you know, 12-hour days instead of 14. So that's the characteristics. But it was not successful, all right? It just, it, you know, what people did at work, here's the other thing. The workers didn't work as hard as they should have because he didn't force them to. So he sold, he sold it, and he decided to emigrate to the United States. So in 1825, he goes to Indiana where he sets up another model community, which fails also. This one lasted five years. And then what also didn't help his cause, besides his anti-vice uh, rules, anti-drinking, he had, he had kind of, un he had, um, unpopular, kind of radical ideas about religion. Let's just say, we don't have to get into it anymore in depth, but if you had really, out, if you had religious beliefs outside the mainstream of what everybody believed, they were suspicious of you. They just automatically labeled you an atheist, even if you still believed in God. But if you began, and you could do your own research on him if you want to. Ultimately, he's going to return to He's going to basically return, so his religion was really off-putting to people, okay? And if they don't trust you in your religion, they're not going to trust you in anything else, all right? He returns back to England where he becomes a social reformer. And he help, will help usher in. The Factory Act of 1835, which is one of the ones on your nice, make sure you don't lose this and you have it in there and you review it. But this one isn't actually on here. But it's, it's, uh, the Factory Act also prohibited children under nine from working. It required two hours of education a day. And what he had also instituted in his, his model communities, he pushed for a 12-hour workday. And then in 1847, it's not on here, but they reduced the workday to 10 hours. So this is an image of Lou, Lou, I'm sorry, New Harmony. Uh, in Indiana. So, I don't know, about five years ago I was driving across country. I was heading back west from the east coast and I'm, I'm hauling on the interstate in southern Indiana and I go, zoom! Uh, past the sign says, exit, New Harmony. So I'm, I'm sitting in the car going, New Harmony, New Harmony, where am I going New Harmony? New Harmony! Pull over, you turn. So I visited there across the river and it's a, it's a, it's a museum. The town's a museum. Okay, people still live in it. But people live in the town, but some of the buildings have our museum.
museum pieces that you can go on tour on, such as Owen's house, which we see right here. Okay, two houses down, somebody's living in their house, okay? So I didn't have time to do the, uh, it was too hot, can't leave the weird dogs, plus for some odd reason they don't let you bring them into Owen's house. Okay, so yeah, no animals like, so I just peered through the window. But what's ironic is this house was on the corner of <laughs> and Brewery Street. <laughs> so he's probably turning over in his grave. Now he returned his his children, he got he was married, his children stayed in the United States, one of them became a US senator. So this is actually you can build a dorm you can tour the dormitory buildings for the housing for the workers. They're still there, they're very nice, okay. They must have been very nice at the time period. So the last one we're gonna get to is a Charles Fourier. I'm, I'm briefly going to mention him. Uh, most of our socialists will be French. There was a surprise, okay, and because of our Parisians. And he said the cooperation was the secret to social success. So he was very diligent about Oregon, probably too diligent because his will fail too. In fact, none of the French ones last even uh, uh, as long as the English and American ones do. So one of his was tried in Massachusetts. It didn't take very long either. He organized them into phalanxes. He wanted to pay people based on the job that they did or their interest. He's really trying to be proactive, thinking of the worker instead of the owner. And he said, hey, poverty is the main cause of disorder. And therefore, we need to have some kind of a minimum wage, which would not be very popular among the owner class. It's the same conversations they're still having today, where the Republican Party in this country is the party of big business. It's just basically their platform. They want to reduce taxes, they believe, which will spur the economy. Okay, and attempts to do this, you know, have work, haven't worked. Okay, Reaganomics, uh, as well as the, you know, everything that was tried through the eight years of the Bush administration. But nonetheless, our Republicans are wealthy, and they don't want to pay tax. They don't want to pay as high taxes, and they think it will trickle down to lower businesses. Okay, and they and they are adamantly opposed to raising the minimum wage, which I think Obama and the Democrats have. On the federal level, he raised it. Huh? On the federal level, he raised it. Yeah, he did on the federal level. Okay. So, uh, what is it now then? John, but uh, in California, there. California has a higher one, too, than yeah. other places. This is up the states for everything else. Okay, what he did is he identified, all this part here is less important than knowing his name and that he's failed, but he identified eight, 810 types of characters of people, characteristics that people had, and he put them into kind of like a mix, and he said, hey, the ideal number of workers in a phalanx of one community of workers would be 1,620 people. And then, of course, what will also be, and so while Owen had kind of strange ideas about religion, Fourier has strange ideas about women, that they should have equal rights. <laughs> See, we have other isms we're going to get into also in the 19th century that makes the 19th century so interesting, like feminism. Then we can start using that term. Even though the roots of it, we can go all the way back to Christina Pizan, if you remember going back. Okay, let me just give you a couple stats on demographics and income. Okay, first of all, 1750. I'm going to give you a stat for 1750 and 1850. What the urban uh, urban uh, percent was, how many people lived in cities. Okay. In 1750, it was 15% urban, 50% of the population lived in cities, 50% urban, 100 years later, it's 60% urban. Okay? So that's a big jump. This represents, the key word is urbanization, the growth of cities. Okay? Urbanization, the growth of cities. Okay? Draw an arrow up to solidarity and class interest. It's a magnifying by 1850. <laughs> but at the same time, in that hundred years, per capita income doubles. What's per capita mean? Per person. When you just average it out. 
per capita income double. So the con what we're saying is people's standard of living is going to go up. It'll really wrap up after 1750. Okay? And one other thing. Um, oh, one other thing. Uh, uh, women marry younger. Why couldn't women marry younger? Because in the old days, before 1750, most of them were rural. Therefore, they couldn't marry until their husband had land. So now they're working where? In the cities and factories. So they have income. They're marrying earlier. Therefore, they're having children earlier. Okay? Last slide, France. The most significant numbers of socialists were in France before the revolts of 1848, where we'll see a kind of ripple effect in Europe. This is this key revolt period. And they combined, and here's what makes it so deadly, they're going to combine re radical republicanism, By that we mean not the Republican Party in the United States. We mean the idea of having a republic government. Radical republicanism plus socialism. And it's going to be our Parisian workers who since 1792, I guess we could say 1789 in the storming of the Bastille, but since 1792 we became radicalized. And they are going to be the tipping point for revolutions in the 17, I'm sorry, the 1820s, 1830s, and 1840s. So this is where that quote comes that I've said before. When France sneezes, everybody else catches a cold. The other European nations catches cold. So what happens in Paris and France? It spreads. So nothing's really different than the French Revolution. Deep hostility to the middle class owners, the bourgeoisie. Deep hostility to the bourgeoisie owners. Why? Because the owners discriminated against workers. They feared the workers. Why not? We associated with the mob. 1792, 1793, the commune, the September massacres, the Gulag. Okay, deep hostility. In fact, uh, owners made workers carry identity cards that had to be signed by the owner, by the workers, by the owners that the factory they worked in, that deeply resented it. Deep hostility to the middle classes. You'll see that play out when I get to the revolts. Now, his name is Louis Blanc. You will see this picture again. You can highlight his name. I'm not making a card, but he's significant for a number of reasons. Number one, he's a journalist. By the way, if you don't know, a journalist is the most dangerous occupation in the world. I don't know that. Huh? Maybe not in this country, but certainly in Syria, and elsewhere, okay, in Afghanistan, anywhere. Okay, it is actually the most dangerous occupation in the world to be a foreign journalist. Okay, he organized a, a kind of a, a journal called the Organization of Work. And what he, what he promoted were these social workshops. You want to highlight that we will see these implemented. Okay, and what the social workshops were, were uh, worker control, state manufacturing, worker controlled state manufacturing. They will be short-lived, by the way, but and they will be implemented for a short period of time. Now, this last one, too, here I want you to put a star on. The, his this social workshops and his writings in the Organization of Work in 1839 will have an effect on Britain in what will be called the Chartres Movement. We have the word movement in front of it. It's really a, a word for almost like a political party, but it's not a political party yet. It wants to be a political party. The Chartres, what they want is working class representation in Parliament. They want working class representation in Parliament. 
which means they have to have the right to do what? To have vote. that. Vote. To vote. I mean, they wanted the right to vote. And they will, and we'll talk about it again, uh, they will um, have a petition. They will, per, they will pre submit a petition to Britain of six million workers, worker names on this petition. But it fails to pass Parliament because, well, no, not so much that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pa Parliament feared uh, the working class vote, so that's one reason why. They feared the working class vote, and there were also some riots that broke out that just reaffirmed that the working class is on the edge of becoming the mob. Okay, we'll revisit this. And then last, the term communism will eventually be, it, it starts off as the same for communism, and I want you to understand, it will sometimes be still used as a synonym for uh, socialism and communism as synonyms, but Marx and Engel create the term to distinguish themselves from the utopian socialists. Uh, Frederick Engel, Engels and Karl Marx, they will be collaborators, and Marx is the father of communism. They begin to use this term to distinguish their ideas from utopian socialists. So you, they said the utopian socialists are dreamers. If you think you can reform communism, forget it, they said. Marx said, you can't reform communism, you've got to replace it, and you've got to replace it with a revolution, or it won't stick. So this will be seen, it'll take on a new meaning after 1917, okay, and the Russian Revolution. Okay, that's it.